All right, you will need Bibles. You will need Bibles. Now, I know when you walked in, there were a few things. There, there is a smell in the room, isn't there? There is a smell in the room. It's these, this incense that is burning. Uh, it has a very... So some people obviously don't like the smell of it. Some people love this smell. There is this that's going on. There is this up here, which I will let you see a little bit later on. Um, but I'm trying to awaken your senses to the lesson tonight. So not only are you smelling things, you're going to touch things here in just a little bit. But I also i have got a study guide for you. It is in the back. It is on the table. And so there should be plenty for everybody. Plenty of study guides. You are going to need Bibles tonight. And we're going to start off by opening up to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And this is going to finish up our Christmas series for this year. Next week we will not meet because next week it will only be a couple of days before Christmas. And so we are encouraging you, spend time with your families, rejoice about the Savior with your families and together. Let me read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. If you do not have a Bible and would like to follow along, it is printed on your study guide, but that's small print for me. It might be small print for you. I'm going to read it from, huh? It's really big print, really, really big. Like it's huge. Like you're blown away at the size of it. Can you believe I fit that many words on the page with how big the print is? I mean, it's remarkable, isn't it? Let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king... Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod summoned the wise men secretly, or then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go. And search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So you guys have heard that passage, those verses read the last few weeks. You've just heard it again. This is a story that gets read at least one time a year during the Christmas time of year. 
because we focus on the birth of Jesus. We fo- focus on, the, on him as a child, as an infant. We talk about Bethlehem. We talk about the wise men and the shepherds. We talk about the star and the angels. We talk about all those things at least once a year. And it is a wonderful thing to focus in on the remarkable and the amazing thing that happened here in Matthew 1 and 2. I'll go ahead and make this statement. There are so many miracles in the Bible, and one day I should probably do a count of how many miracles from Genesis until Revelation, people say, are in the Bible. But there are hundreds, thousands of miracles that are mentioned in the Bible. I do believe that the miracle of the birth of Christ, God becoming man, God emptying himself, take on flesh, I believe that that is the greatest miracle ever recorded in human history, that God became flesh. I think this is the greatest miracle of all time. It's why my favorite time of year is Christmas. It's why every year when Christmas rolls around, I have to do several things in order to say this is the Christmas season. And it has less and less to do with Santa Claus and less and less to do with Christmas trees. And it has more to do with what I read and what I listen to during this time of year. We celebrate the greatest miracle of all. All time. Grasp that. The greatest miracle that's ever happened. God. God took on flesh. The incarnation is the big term for it. So we join the wise men in this narrative in worshiping this one who's come. And I want to briefly, briefly, briefly kind of hint at what we've talked about before, and then we're going to dive into our new study for the night. But these wise men came, and Brad on the first night did a wonderful job of kind of unpacking, who were these guys? Where did they come from? How did they figure this stuff out? What in the world was going on when they came? How many of them were there? And the answer is we really don't know. But there was more than one for sure because it was wise men. But I think we'd be foolish to think that it was limited only to three. There were three gifts. But these wise men came from the east. They figured it out. They understood who this child was that was born. And they come to worship him. And they're foreigners. They shouldn't have had any clue at all. But they come to worship him, even though all of Bethlehem is like asleep to this knowledge. Even though Herod is asleep to this knowledge. Even though the scribes and the prophets know it's coming, they're asleep to it. And these guys get it. They understood it. And they came to worship him. We want to join in that worship. And they brought him three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And the first night, Brad made sure to tell you exactly what you guys probably already knew. This is, when they brought those three gifts, this wasn't just something that they were looking around and go, hey, I've got some gold over there in that closet. Let's take that. And then this guy goes, oh, hey, uh, there's frankincense over there. Let's just pick that up and go to, oh, myrrh. We've got myrrh. Let's take that. That sounds like, this wasn't just, this wasn't just random stuff they grabbed and brought. These were very intentional gifts. And they pointed us to the child they were coming to worship, the reality of who he is. And Brad told us, when we're coming to the gift of gold, and number one on your study guide, gold indicates this child is the king of kings. And he was born of the line of David. That He was not only born of the line of David, but that he was virgin born, and so he was not under the curse that fell on the line of David through Jehoiakim. He is the king of kings. There will never, ever, ever, ever be a ruler who is greater than this child. Last week, Johnny 
stood before you and he took the gift of frankincense and he brought up something remarkable and amazing to consider. These wise men probably didn't understand exactly what it was they were looking at. They didn't recognize that they were looking at the full deity of God when they looked at it. And they probably couldn't wrap their minds around it because even we can't wrap our minds around it. We have the fullness of Scripture. They looked at this child, though, and they knew that there was something remarkable about him. They knew that he was God, that he was deity, that there was something about him. But because of his, because of his deity... Because of his godness, the frankincense also points to a reality of who Jesus is. In that Jesus is the only one who is perfect, who is righteous, who is good. He is the only one who is worthy to do something about our sinful estate. He is the only one who can enter the holy place. He is the only one who can offer up prayers. He is the only one who can lay out a sacrifice. He is the only one who can go into the temple, into the holy place, into the holy of holies, and appeal to the mercy of God so that we can have mercy. And so when we look at frankincense, we need to understand that frankincense, number two, shows he's priest of priests. And that smell that you're smelling, this incense that's burning, is frankincense. You're actually smelling frankincense. And the reason why we understand it as the priests of priests and the reason why they would burn it, uh, we've been through this a little bit in our study of Revelation. I will quickly uh, allude to what goes on. Um, We understand that God... Uh, when he had the temple constructed and built, there was the holy of holies and there was the holy place. Now, only one time a year could a priest go into the holy of holies. Only one time a year could the priest go in there. But every single day, a priest could go into just the holy place. And the reason he would go into the holy place is he would go in, there was an altar in there, and he would put incense in the altar every morning and every evening. And the smoke would rise and the, uh, the smell would fill the temple and it would spill out into all uh, around where all those uh, who were close to the temple could smell it. And it was meant to represent that the prayers of Israel is being raised up. The prayers of the priests are being raised up. Every morning and every evening, they would put frankincense in the altar in the holy place. This was the smell that was pouring out of the temple day in and day out. A smell that you are now either enjoying or choking back. That's the smell. But frankincense points to the deity of this child and that he alone is the priest who can do this. So that is a quick catch-up to the gifts and that leads us to the final gift, the last gift, and that is myrrh. And myrrh, in the form that they would have brought it, would have been an oil. Now, let me tell you all something. Uh, You can get the frankincense kind of cheap right now, okay? You can get frankincense a little cheaper now these incense because of the way that they're they're made and stuff like that that's not too expensive myrrh is still pretty costly okay so what i'm holding up right now just this little bit of myrrh is probably at least 15 dollars worth of myrrh okay just this little bit's at least 15 dollars all right what i'm going to get y'all to do i'm gonna let y'all pass around if you want you can Smell it, kind of see what it smells like. And um, you can dip your finger in it, okay? And you can, you can put some on your hand if you want to, anything like that, okay? All right? So let me show you, though, first. This is an oil. And the myrrh informs us that he is the sacrifice of sacrifices. And you might be asking, how does the myrrh point to that reality? How does the myrrh point to that he is a sacrifice of sacrifices? Myrrh has a lot of benefits. It has a lot of very, very good uh, minerals and vitamins. It's made from a tree sap, okay? And 
they have altered the color of it in the form that I have just to make it, I guess, look less severe. But when it normally comes out, it's kind of a, a dark, kind of a ruddy, reddish color. All right, it's made from a tree sap. And they go through this process of steaming it in order to get it into the process of oil. All right, but that's what myrrh is. And it's still very, very costly, still very, very expensive because the process to get it, even today, is hard. But back then, I mean, can you imagine what it took to steam myrrh to be able to get it? That's, that's a little difficult. Um, come here, John. You can take this and you can, you can sit down with it, smell it. If you want to, hey, not much because I want everyone to be able to see it, but if you want to dip a finger in it and put it on your hand, anything like that, you do that. But just pass it along, okay? Myrrh informs us that he is the sacrifice of sacrifices, all right? And that is good stuff. Listen, that is, it is very good for your hands. It's very good for, uh, there's a lot of benefits to it. But why does it say that he's the sacrifice of sacrifices? Well, because of this one thing. And I'm going to point to you a use of myrrh. And then we're going to look at the reality of what it points to. For kings, high officials, governors, things like that, what they would do is they would set aside provisions. They would set aside uh, plans for when they died. They would buy, if they were wealthy, they could buy a big tomb that would be kind of a monument to who they were. All these sorts of things. They would, they would go ahead and have... Um, mourners, people who would cry at their funerals, they would have them prepared for those sorts of things. One thing that they would also do is they would ensure that their body would last as long as possible. One of the ways they would make sure their body would last as long as possible is they would sometimes have precious oils set aside so that when they perished, when they died, People could take those oils and they could actually rub the oil over the dead body. And what that oil, when you would massage it in even to a dead body, it would preserve the body. It would help it not suffer decay quite as quickly. Myrrh was one of the most sought after oils for for this purpose, for a wealthy person to be covered in that oil so that his body would not see decay. So that his body would be preserved. Are you, are you raising your hand for a question? It's not like a mothball. <laughs> so, so, like, okay. So, like, a mothball. So, a mothball repels moths. So, myrrh is an oil. <laughs> It's not like a, a repellent for moths. I don't know if I... Did you say mothball? I'm really trying to figure out the connection. I just can't... Oh, okay, yeah. Well, he put them in there so it would keep moths from like, going after him. But yeah, mothballs have a... I have a crazy smell. You know, I should have brought mothballs, Casey. That's what I should have. That's right. The myrrh would, the myrrh, okay, I see, okay, I see. The, the myrrh would be a deterrent for those parasites that would maybe like, I see what you're saying. That would maybe be a parasite. Do what? That's right. That's right. So the myrrh would be something they put over the body, okay? Now, this is a strange thing. Listen, listen, the gold we get, okay? Gold still has value today, and there's still gold all over the world. We still recognize the importance of it today. All right, so gold, we're like, yeah, that's a cool gift. Frankincense, we're like, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a cool gift. But to bring myrrh up there, this, this oil that's used on the bodies of rich people when they die, what a weird gift to bring a child. What a strange and awkward thing. 
It's almost like saying, hey, let's have a baby shower. Who wants to bring the casket? It's a terrible thought, isn't it? It's maybe not that severe, but that's the mindset that but you bring this myrrh up there, and it has a few uses, to be certain. But it conjures up this image of rubbing it on a body. So why bring the myrrh? How does it point that he is the sacrifice of sacrifices? Well, in order to do that, I have to kind of get into it with y'all. What is a sacrifice? Dying for something else? else? Yeah. Who initiated sacrifices? Who set that up? Yeah, right there. Number four, God initiated the sacrificial system. God initiates it. God brings forth the sacrificial system. Uh, It'll come up on the screen. Did it come up? Do we have that one? Number four. God initiated the sacrificial system. Is that one not up there? God initiated the sacrificial system. No, uh, no, no, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. So, so the, it was, I, I might have I missed that slide. I apologize if I missed that slide. It says, God initiated the sacrificial system. So what is a sacrifice? We're going we're gonna to define terms. A sacrifice, and that definition is up there. I know that for sure. A sacrifice is offering something precious for a cause. Okay, so let's just leave it at that for right now. It's offering something precious for a cause. A sacrifice is offering something precious for a cause. Sometimes we talk about how you can sacrifice your savings for something that you deem very valuable. Okay? So a sacrifice is offering something precious for a cause. God initiated the sacrificial system. He initiated the offering of something precious for a cause. And why did he initiate the sacrificial system? He initiated it because he wanted atonement to take place. Now, what is atonement? Some of you should remember that word and should know how to work through it, how to navigate through it. What is atonement? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Atonement is satisfying something or someone for an offense. Satisfying something or someone for an offense. So a sacrifice, offering something precious for a cause, what's the cause? We've offended something or we've offended someone. And so we need to offer something precious so that we can satisfy that someone that we've offended. Does that make sense, guys? Does that make sense? God initiates the sacrificial system. God initiates it, and and so he does it. I've got two Bible verses that we're going to look up. We're going to look up Romans 6, 23. Who who would like to open up? Okay, so I can go over Romans 6, 23. You might even have it memorized. And Leviticus 17, 11, uh, go for it, Logan. Um, And here's the reason why we bring these up. Okay, Leviticus is all about the sacrificial system. It all covers up what the sacrificial system is. But maybe that verse, and that verse is, is really the, the, I guess, the cornerstone of what is going on with these sacrifices. All right, so Romans chapter 6, 23, we recognize that there is an offense that's been made against something or someone, and that because of that offense, something precious has to be offered. So Romans six twenty three tells us what? Stop. For the wages of what? Sin. That's the offense. Sin is the offense. And what is a wage? A wage is what we earn, what we deserve deserve because of that offense. So go ahead. For the wages of sin is? All right. The wages of sin is death. Because of sin, because of the offense, we deserve death. You guys have all heard this countless times before but because of sin we deserve death okay if we deserve death that's not good news for us because ava i don't know about you but i don't want to die do you want to die 
No. Does anyone in here just kicks and giggles about wanting to die? No. No one is. Because death is an awful and it's an evil wage. It's actually an unnatural thing in the truest sense of what it is. But we don't want that death. So God initiates the sacrificial system, and Leviticus 17.11 kind of gives us a, a glimpse maybe in the, uh, into why. Go for it. It's life blood that makes atonement. The life of a creature is in its blood. And if you're going to die, if your life, if your blood is going to be spilled, if you're going to have death come upon you, then the only way to make atonement for it is something has to be sacrificed. Something else has to die on your behalf. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So God initiates the sacrificial system. We understand what sacrifice is and what atonement is. And not only did he establish a sacrificial system, he established, God establishes a day of atonement. So God establishes a day of atonement. And that day of atonement it was one day out of the year. It was called Yom Kippur. And the priest, the high priest, could go not just into the holy place. Remember, where did he go when he went to the holy place? What did he offer? What did he put up there? Frankincense. How many times a day did he do it? Twice a day. Once in the morning, once in the evening. When offered the incense, the prayers. All right. But only one day out of the year, called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, only one day out of the year could he go, not just into the holy place, but into the most holy place, into the holy of holies. And in that holy of holies, here's what he would do. He would, and uh, the holy place was separated from the holy of holies by a curtain. The curtain would be pulled back. And in that Holy of Holies, there was this thing called the Ark of the Covenant. And he would take in there a bowl filled with blood. Now, this was blood from a sacrifice he had made outside of the temple. He would take a goat, he would slit its throat, he would catch the blood in the bowl. Then he would take the body of that animal, he would offer it up on an altar, burn it up as a sacrifice. And then he wearing um, high priestly robes and garments, he would walk into the Holy of Holies with this bowl of blood. And this is what he would do. Seven times he would dip his fingers into the bowl and he would splatter it on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. The lid was called the mercy seat. He would splatter it seven times onto the mercy seat saying, God, because we have sinned, death is our wage, death is what we earn, but this sacrifice has taken the death for us. Please have mercy upon us. And do it seven times, sprinkling blood all over the mercy seat seven times. From there, he would back out. He never turned his back on, in the most holy place. He would back out, and then he would go and he would clean himself off. But here's the thing. This sacrificial system, this day of atonement, these things, these sacrifices, all right, number five, these sacrifices were given to absorb the wrath of God or to point us to the fact that the wrath of God needs to be absorbed. The, the thing is, you've sinned just like I have sinned. You have sinned, just like I have sinned. And what we deserve because of that sin is death. Our blood to be spilled. We deserve the wrath of God to be poured out on us, to crush us under the very weight of His righteousness, of His goodness. 
But God established the sacrificial system, sacrifices, to show us that His wrath can be absorbed. His wrath can be poured out on something else on our behalf. Does that make sense? Are you guys hanging with me? Are you guys staying with me? You guys there, right? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. Will someone read that for me? Casey, I want you to flip to it and just stay there because you'll read uh, verses 5 through 7 here in just a little bit. Over to Hebrews 10, I want you to read verses 3 through 4 for us. All right, so there in Hebrews, the author of Hebrews tells us that those sacrifices, the sacrifices that I just told you about, the whole thing about going into the Holy of Holies, doing blood, sprinkling it all over the mercy seat, all the incense, all the sacrifices outside, all the sacrifices everywhere in the Old Testament, all those things were done and they were a reminder of sin. Even Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, done and it was a reminder of sin but then it says clearly that the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient to take away sin that even though god established a sacrificial system the blood of bulls and goats was insufficient to really do it it could not absorb the wrath of God. It could not complete the job. It couldn't do it. God initiates it. He establishes it so that we see that His wrath can be transferred to something else. His his anger can be poured out on something else on our behalf. But those bulls and goats, they weren't good enough. And so every single day, there were fresh sacrifices. Every single year, there was blood sprinkled all over the mercy seat. The blood of bulls and goats was not enough. We need a better sacrifice. We need a purer sacrifice. To put it really on the nose, we need a God-sized sacrifice. So, God sent His Son to be that perfect sacrifice. God sent His Son to be that perfect sacrifice. And understand... He really was born. He really was a baby. And this child was born into humanity, emptied himself because there was no other sacrifice that could make atonement for us. I could not ever die for you because I'm just as sinful. I'm more sinful than any of you. And you can't make a sacrifice for me because you're just as sinful as I am. Bulls and goats can't do the trick. So this child was born and given and he was given and coming into humanity, God made flesh so that we could have a perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 kind of finishes out that thought. I want you to read that. And someone else over to Hebrews 9, I want you to read 11 through 14. Go for it, Aiden. And then uh, you'll, uh, Josiah, I'm going to have you open up to 1 John 4, okay? So, Casey, are you st- did you stay there? Will you read verses 5 through 7 for us? Do 
In other words, Jesus says, you have prepared for me a body to take the place, to take and absorb the wrath that's due on me. Christ was prepared a body to absorb that wrath on my behalf, to be the perfect sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, read those for us. Who did I have? Aiden, is that you? In other words there, guys, that verse is, 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 is key to understanding that Christ, if we've got the illustration that he is the king of kings, the priest of priests, and the sacrifices of sacrifices, that verse is paramount to understanding that if the priest before walked into the holy of holies with a bowl of blood and sprinkled that sacrifice onto the mercy seat, we see Christ from that verse, as that highest of priests, the priest of priests, who walks in before the mercy of God, and he doesn't pour out the blood of a different sacrifice, rather he himself being the perfect and holy, righteous Son of God, he himself offers his life, his blood, as a sacrifice before the mercy of God. Do you guys see that? Are you guys hanging with me? Are y'all staying with me? Okay. So God sent His Son to be a perfect sacrifice. And then we see, and I love, I love this, this idea or this mindset. Because of what Christ did, uh, number seven, the Son of God, absorbed the wrath of God so that we could be loved by God. The Son of God absorbed the wrath of God so we could be loved by God. The Bible paints us, and I've, I, I've worked with, the, uh, with you through this a couple weeks back. The Bible doesn't paint us as friends of God in our natural state. Rather, we are enemies of God deserving of God's wrath, deserving of the punishment of God. And in that place, we are not lovely and we are not lovable to God. But the Son of God came, absorbed the wrath of God so that we could be loved by God as Father. And we're going to do a little bit of an exercise. So, Josiah, you're going to have to read a little loud. <clears throat> we're going to open up to 1 John, or you're going to be in 1 John. And I want you to read 1 John, verses 7 through 12. All right? And this is what you're going to do with me, okay? You're going to count the number of times that you hear him say the word love. In just these few verses, 1 John 4, 7 through 12, we're going to count the number of times that we hear him say the word love. All right, so go for it whenever you're in. Make sure you say it loud, and you guys, I mean, you guys are going to count, okay?
Raise your hand if you got. Four, raise your hand if you got fourteen. Raise your hand if you got fifteen. Raise your hand if you got twenty. Raise your hand if you got six hundred and eighty-two. All of you in the last ones were wrong. All right. No, I got fifteen. Fifteen times love is brother. Now, now the reason why I have us do that, what obviously, obviously, what are these verses about? Love. love. Obviously, they're about love. But in those verses, in those verses that is, I mean, just dripping with the love of God, in those verses. You also have a word that gets said. Did anybody hear a word they just like, what? Wait, what? Say it again. Propitiation. Can you guys say propitiation? Can you say it three times fast? Incorrect. Propitiation. Now, in the middle, in the middle of these verses, which is all about love, You've got this word propitiation, which we don't use very often at all. So what would you assume is the definition of propitiation? Yeah, it's got to have something to do with love, right? It's got to have something to do with love. Well, let me give you a better definition of what propitiation is. Propitiation is the wrath of God absorbed in the Son of God who is Jesus Christ. The wrath of God absorbed by the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. That's propitiation. The wrath of God being absorbed. The wrath of God being taken on. The full fury of God's anger being poured out on the Son of God. That's propitiation. Why in the world, in these verses where we hear the word love on repeat, constantly, why do we get a word thrown in there right in the middle of it talking about the wrath of God? Why? Can you finish it? That who, that who, I've, I've failed. Here's the reason why. In the middle of these verses where you've got all this love being talked about and that God is love and the love of God and how rich we can love because of God's love and being called beloved. And called to love God and love people. And in the middle of it, we've got a verse, or we've got a word, excuse me. Propitiation. The wrath of God absorbed by the Son of God. Propitiation for our sins. And it's for this reason. It's because the most... The greatest act of love that has ever been witnessed in all of the world is when the Son of God, Jesus, absorbed the wrath of God. The most loving thing that this creation has ever witnessed was when the Son of God absorbed the wrath of God. The world has never seen greater wrath and the world has never seen greater love. And it's because of Christ being born, emptying himself, being born of a virgin, being the king of kings, the priest of who could go into the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice, and who offered himself as the sacrifice. It's because of that reality we can be loved and called beloved ones of God with 
without propitiation, without Christ absorbing the wrath of God, we will never have a right to be called loved by God or to claim or to hold as our own His love. Without propitiation, without this sacrifice of sacrifices, we'll never have that right. So where did it happen? Where did he become the sacrifice of sacrifices? Where did propitiation take place? Where was the wrath of God absorbed for people? Where did it happen? At the cross. There we have it at the end, number eight, at the cross. Jesus became the final sacrifice. You want to know why there are no more priests going into the Holy of Holies to offer sacrifices before the mercy seat of God? Do you want to know why they don't have frankincense burning day in and day out as the prayers of the priests and of the people, of God's chosen people? Do you want to know why that's done away with? Because at the cross, Jesus finished it. He finalized it. He absorbed all of the wrath due me. And guys, you've heard this. Y'all have heard me do this. I mean, if y'all heard me do it once, y'all probably heard me do it a hundred times. But it's worth going through again. Guys, Christ suffered on that cross. Do y'all, do y'all know that? He suffered on that cross. Christ was falsely accused. He was put on trial, an illegal trial. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was spit upon. He was whipped with the cat of nine tails. You've heard me explain that. So whip with nine tails ends on it, stone or glass or something sharp woven into it so that when it hits flesh, it is designed to grip that flesh and to rip it from you. He was beaten with that. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They hung him on a cross. And on the cross, do you guys remember you don't die because of blood loss. Do you guys remember what is the mech- how do you, how does it kill you, Lexi? Well, hang on, say it again, Lexi. Yeah, you suffocate. Your lungs can't do it. When you're on the cross, the way your body is contorted and the way you get so exhausted, you slump down and you can't breathe correctly. You can breathe in very easily, but you cannot breathe out unless you straighten your body. And so, I mean, just imagine, in fact, we can try, just breathe in three times. We'll do it together. Breathe in three times without breathing out and see how it presses on your lungs. Let's do it together. Let it out. Do y'all feel the pressure mounting and building? And finally, they collapse. And they don't have the strength to be able to pick themselves up anymore and they suffocate on the cross. It's a terrible and awful way to die. Not only did Jesus suffer, though, at the hands of man, but the Bible tells us that God Himself poured out His wrath. That He was the propitiation for our sins. And because His blood was shed, our high priest who is Christ, now doesn't sprinkle with the blood of bulls and goats. He doesn't sprinkle with a lesser sacrifice. But 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, 
Let me just read that to you. It says this. I'll, I'll read verse 1 and then verse 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. The blood of Christ is what has been offered before the mercy of God to absorb all of the wrath so that I can be called a beloved child of God. I'm going to end with an illustration. We understand that Christ, or hopefully it's been seen that Christ is the sacrifice of sacrifices, that myrrh was a gift pointing to that reality and what it means that he was the sacrifice of sacrifices. But still we might sit there and we might think, well, how is it that, how is it that if Jesus died 2,000 years ago and maybe God did pour out his wrath and maybe he did pour out his fury and maybe he did pour out all of his anger on Jesus on that cross but man you don't know what I have done you don't know the sins that I've committed you don't know what I've done even today I still sin I still struggle with it For those who are in Christ, we're not okay with that. We don't don't just settle for that. We always are striving in our sanctification process. But we can have comfort in the sacrifice of Christ because everything that could be burned or everything that could be consumed has already been burned has already experienced the wrath of God. Everything that could have his anger poured out on has already had it poured out in the person of Christ. And there's an illustration I'm going to give you to help you maybe understand this. You guys, uh, well, when when I was growing up, there was a game called the Oregon Trail, but it was a legitimate thing. If y'all know the Oregon Trail, how settlers would move to Oregon, and they would go for miles and miles and miles and it was a treacherous thing to go and if you moved your family there you never know what you were going to encounter but several uh, several people died on the way out there one of the one of the big disasters was when a wildfire would break loose and it would sweep through the trail, and countless families were consumed in wildfires. This one particular family is on the Oregon Trail, and they see miles and miles ahead, they see this huge wildfire being blown at an alarming rate in their direction. And it's so wide, they know that they can't go to the right or left to to get away from it. They know that they can't turn around and run fast enough away from it because the wind's blowing too quickly. They know that that fire is coming for them and that they're going to perish if that fire reaches them. So the father quickly gets out and he starts making a fire as well. He starts making a fire behind their caravan. So they're facing the fire, and the fire's coming to them. And the father goes to the rear of the caravan and makes a fire. And sure enough, the same wind that is blowing that wildfire towards the family picks up the fire in the back, and it spreads it, and it takes the fire to the rear. At that point, the father instructs the family because the fire has been blown, it's gone away. He says, go where the fire was burned. 
They take their caravan and their family and they go and they stand where the fire has already burned. So that when the fire reaches them, does the fire, when, does the fire consume them? Why not? Because there's nothing else to burn. Understand this, guys. Understand this. That when we recognize Christ as the sacrifice of sacrifices who absorbed not just a part of it, but he absorbed every bit of the fury and wrath of God, when we are made alive in him and when we are standing in his accomplishment, we are like that family that, yes, the wrath of God is sure and the fury of God is absolute and it is coming against all ungodliness and all wickedness. And in our own selves, man, we, we cannot stand. We cannot survive it. We are not able to endure it. But because of what Christ did, because He absorbed every bit of the wrath, because He already took the fury and the fire of God, He stands us where the fire has already burned. And we are saved, and not just saved, but we're called beloved 15 times. We are called loved ones of God. That's the child who's been born. That's this son who has been given. Jesus came as our king of kings, as our priest of priests, and thank goodness is our sacrifice of sacrifices. Let me pray for us. And Joe, you're going to sing one more song. And you guys, we're going to sing a song. It's a Christmas song. It's about this child who was born. Sing to him. He deserves it. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for the reality that you sent your Son as our King of Kings, as our Priest of Priests, and as our great sacrifice. And Father, it's because of his work on the cross, we can stand as beloved children of yours. I pray, Father, that we have a fresh and a new understanding of what Your Son came to do and how He did it. And Father, I pray that this season, this time of year, would be a season of so much worship that we would join like those wise men and we would come and we would worship this child who was born, this son who was given, this king who is going to rule and to reign, this priest who was righteous to go into the holiest of holies before the mercy of God and who offered himself as a sacrifice so that we can have life in you. I pray this would be a time of worship tonight in this entire Christmas season. As in your son's name, Jesus, we ask these things and for his sake. Amen.